As we move on to the second part of our program today, which is a discussion with two keynote speakers, it's my very great pleasure to introduce Ambassador uh, Jerry Firestein, who's kindly agreed to step in for <clears throat> Ann Patterson. Ann really wanted to be with us today, but Secretary Kerry asked her to accompany him out to Jeddah and the region um, as they try to follow up on the new policy shift that uh, President Obama has just announced with regards to the Islamic State, an important issue and one that, uh, of course, many people in Washington and around the world and in the press are seized with uh, this week particularly. But uh, Egypt still remains enormously important uh, to the United States, and it certainly is a major focus of the Middle East Institute. Um, here with us today to discuss U.S.-Egyptian relations is uh, Ambassador Jerry Fierstein. He is uh, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Near East Bureau in the Department of State. And he is, has a long history of deep involvement in the Middle East region. I've known him for over 40 years. He's a dear friend. He had a, one of the most successful ambassadorships in, uh, in Yemen recently. He has served in uh, Pakistan, in Saudi Arabia, in Tunisia, and in Egypt. And it is my very great pleasure, and I'm very grateful that Jerry is uh, with us this afternoon. Jerry, can you make a few remarks, and then he's kindly offered to uh, answer a couple of my questions, and then we'll turn it over to you, and he'll answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Wendy, and thank you for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, on behalf of Ambassador Patterson, who, uh, as Wendy said, uh, was very much looking forward to, uh, to being here with you today, uh, but uh, Secretary Kerry had other ideas. Um, I'd like to, to thank uh, the Middle East Institute for including us uh, in this important conversation. Much has happened in Egypt over recent months. Much will be happening in the months to come, uh, including the parliamentary elections. Uh, so this is an appropriate time uh, to discuss how, after three long years of political and economic upheaval, uh, Egypt is going to begin moving forward again. Uh, and more importantly, of course, it's also an appropriate time to look at the state of the U.S.-Egyptian relationship and to assess where we are and where we're going. Uh, let me begin with a direct statement. A close, productive U.S. relationship with a secure, stable Egypt that's moving in a positive direction, both economically and politically, is at the heart of U.S. policies in the region. Regardless of any other factor, Egypt remains the anchor of the Arab world, and its voice carries weight, not only in Arab and Islamic fora, uh, but in fact globally. Uh, if there's any doubt about the validity of my assertion, uh, I invite you to think back to the state of our relations in the Middle East uh, in the period prior to 1975, when the kind of collaborative cooperation uh, between our two countries that we have today uh, didn't exist. Indeed, despite the current challenges in our relationship, the fact is that the U.S. and Egypt share common perspectives on the most urgent regional issues, uh, and we are working closely together on strategies to address them. Uh, we share, for example, concerns about the threat of violent extremism uh, operating today from Libya to Iraq. Egyptian Foreign Minister Shukri participated with Secretary Kerry and counterparts from the GCC and regional partners in a meeting yesterday in Jeddah uh, to build a coalition to confront and ultimately to defeat ISIL. Uh, Egypt do, uh, joined us in declaring in the communique issued at the conclusion of that meeting that we stand united against the threat posed by all terrorism, including the so-called Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant, uh, to the region and the world. Similarly, Egypt has joined the other neighbors of Libya, of Libya in the Tunis process uh, aimed at supporting efforts to resolve peacefully 
the internal conflict that has threatened to untrack Libya's political transition in recent months. Uh, as part of that process, Egypt leads the political subcommittee of the Neighbors Group and hosted a few days ago a ministerial gathering that reiterated uh, the Neighbors' support for a process of dialogue and negotiation and rejected outside uh, interference in Libyan affairs. We appreciate Cairo's statement of support for the newly elected Libyan House of Representatives, and we share the Egyptian view that political compromise is the only way forward in Libya uh, where no one mil uh, militia has enough support to dominate a complex political environment. Significantly in recent days, the Egyptian government has resumed its traditional role in helping to promote Israeli-Palestinian dialogue, and once again, negotiating a Gaza ceasefire. We hope that the plan for resuming Israeli-Palestinian negotiations will contribute to a durable peace, uh, but we all know that this is going to be a formidable challenge. Above all, Egypt's efforts once again demonstrated the importance of the Camp David Accords in providing a solid foundation for regional peace and security. No discussion of the regional security picture would be complete without also recognizing the challenges that Egypt itself faces uh, with violent extremist groups operating in Sinai, uh, as well as the recent security incidents in the Western Desert. We stand with the government of Egypt and the Egyptian people in their determination to eliminate the threat to their security and the stability of the country. For that reason, Secretary Kerry determined uh, to release to the Egyptians uh, 10 Apache helicopters that will contribute significantly to their fight against terrorism and extremist violence. We believe that Egypt wants Washington's continued support and is working with us to restore a mutually productive and beneficial relationship. However, going forward, this relationship cannot be based solely on a security partnership adopted in the wake of the Camp David Accords. The world has changed, and we need to address new threats, new regional realities, uh, and new paradigms for security and economic assistance. Egyptians understand this and it will be an important part of our dialogue going forward. Noting then the strong commonality of views between the United States and Egypt regarding many of the most significant challenges confronting our two countries and the region today, where are we in the relationship? It's no secret that the United States has had differences with those who have held power in Egypt in recent years. And these differences have shaken the confidence of both parties about the basic foundations of our partnership. From the time of the February 2011 revolution, the United States has been guided by a desire to support the Egyptian people as they build a new democratic government that respects universal rights and helps them address their substantial economic challenges. We adopted this position because of the importance we attach to the relationship with Egypt and because we believe that democratic politics and open economic systems make stronger nations and better partners. Our commitment to support Egypt's democratic political process, regardless of who won at the ballot box, has generated accusations that the United States somehow engineered both Mohamed Morsi's election and his government's ouster. Uh, many in the United States have been drawn into Egypt's debates. Uh, demanding that the U.S. use all elements of our relationship with Egypt's leaders uh, to force political and economic reforms. As we craft a policy that keeps pace with rapid change in the region and addresses our core interests, uh, we are asking some key questions. Uh, what is President Assisi's vision for Egypt's role in the region and for relations with the United States? How does the government envision it, with, uh, it will implement its obligations to permit full democratic governance and respect for universal rights under the Egyptian constitution? How does the Egyptian government intend to move forward with needed economic reforms in a way that enhances stability by improving the lives of the average Egyptian? The Egyptian people are fully able to direct the future of their nation. 
They have currently prioritized security over a democratic process that created chaos, but Egyptians know now how to voice their opinions and want to be involved in the political process. The challenge, the challenge will be to channel that energy from street protests into building strong institutions and open consultative politics. The U.S. will continue to press for more inclusive governance, basic freedoms, and space for civil society organizations. We see no value in jailing political activists merely for peaceful protests or for convicting journalists. We are concerned that Egypt's arrests and mass trials are only fueling continued low-level protests that keep both tourists and investors wary of returning to Egypt. But the only way to press our support for Egyptian democracy is to remain engaged with Egypt. Egypt's economic recovery and reforms will very much affect Egypt's political stability going forward. This is a very important area where the United States can offer needed support for the Egyptian government. I would mention here that the State Department's senior advisor, Ambassador David Thorne, was in Cairo over the past few days to continue his productive engagement with senior Egyptian officials on efforts to promote much needed economic reform. The needs in Egypt are so very great that it's time for a major shift in the logic underlying economic policy. Even the generous support Egypt has received from Gulf friends is dwarfed by Egypt's growing deficit and the massive infra infrastructure investments needed to bring Egypt into the global economy. Egypt's needs to address systemic problems urgently, including subsidy reform, a sclerotic bureaucracy that impedes entrepreneurship, banks that are reluctant to provide small businesses capital to expand, the failure of the legal system to promote speedy dispute resolution, and the challenge of rapid population growth that makes it necessary to create an astounding 700,000 new jobs every year. President Assisi has taken welcome steps to begin to control deficits and costly subsidies and to increase revenues. He is creating short-term jobs through mega infrastructure projects, although we hope that the effort to rebuild infrastructure will also focus more on the role that the private sector can play in promoting national economic growth. Urgent steps are also needed to spur economic growth through investment and trade. We continue to encourage Egypt to seek an Article 4 IMF program that will create the confidence required to bring investors back to Egypt. And we look forward to a sizable American business presence at the proposed investment conference currently scheduled for next February. In that context, we would like to see an increase in bilateral trade between our two countries, including through expanding uh, the qualified industrial zones that now support 280,000 jobs and provide the fastest access for Egyptian products into the U.S. market. We're working to expand access for both U.S. and Egyptian agricultural products into our respective markets. Through OPIC and XM, we're providing approximately $500 million in support for uh, small and medium enterprise financing and American investors. And we believe there are great opportunities in the energy, IT, and health sectors. Through USAID, we're supporting entrepreneurship and vocational training, especially in tourism and agribusiness. Uh, we look forward to a large U.S. Chamber of Commerce trade mission to Egypt in November. To conclude with a self-evident statement, Egypt is a longtime friend and a critical partner for the United States. While we cannot ignore the very real difficulties in rebuilding a productive relationship with Egypt, we are committed to framing a partnership based on our shared common interests. President Obama and Secretary Kerry have been very clear in their recognition of the importance of our bilateral relationship and in reinforcing our commitment to work with the Egyptian leadership to advance those interests. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Um, that was uh, a very impressive uh, summary of the many different elements that, uh, that make our relationship with Egypt very important to the United States. You know, 
Uh, the U.S.-Egyptian bilateral relationship has really been riding shotgun in this wild roller coaster <laughs> in the last three years. Um, and it's, uh, it's still a car that hasn't stopped yet. Uh, we hear, although I'm very impressed with all of the different aspects of the strengthening of our relationship, you will often hear from Egyptians and even Americans that they don't know what our policy is there. Uh, they don't know that our policy is, they think it's a bit fuzzy. Uh, it doesn't sound fuzzy in your mind, but what I hear uh, and, and what we see when we read about the U.S.-Egyptian relationship is that there is uh, two threads that run through it. One, a relationship based on our values of democracy, of human rights, of rule of law, social justice, women's rights, et cetera, minority rights. And another thread that you mention uh, equally uh, persuasively in your few remarks, and that is that we share interest in the region, interest for stability, interest in uh, foreign, foreign policy, uh, common interests. Are these in conflict? And, and how well is the U.S. government uh, articulating what our priority objectives and interests are in our relationship? What I would say, Wendy, um, is that, is that it, it's certainly true that there are different facets to our relationship. Uh, but I think, uh, as I try to articulate in, in my uh, comments, uh, these are different facets with uh, ultimately the same objective. Uh, the objective that we have, I think, is to, um, to uh, advance a partnership with an Egypt that's a, a strong and stable uh, nation uh, that is able to provide uh, political and economic security for its people, uh, that it's able to address the, uh, the challenges that it confronts, uh, both internally uh, as well as in what is a very complex and difficult regional environment today. Uh, and, and so uh, I think uh, that as you look at the various aspects, uh, if you keep in mind that that is the objective of what we're trying to achieve, uh, it becomes much less fuzzy and much clearer uh, that all of these uh, different elements uh, all have a similar uh, goal, and that is uh, an Egypt that's strong, stable, economically prosperous, and uh, politically uh, progressive. Yeah, I, I get it. And I think uh, most people in the West and in, certainly in the United States, and we sure heard that in the first two panels this morning, um, see stability as sustainable stability as being based on uh, popular buy-in, on inclusion, on uh, citizen participation uh, as the as true foundation for stability over the long run. There are many in the Middle East, uh, including Egypt, that would cease to find stability and see stability first as a strong security force, a strong police, a strong army that can uh, deal effectively with terrorist groups, with uh, violence in the streets. And this definition of what stability is seems to be tripping us up a bit. Hmm. Uh, do you find that? Well, I, I think, and, and here uh, again, um, uh, there, is a, there is a view in the, in, in the U.S. and, and, and certainly in, in this administration uh, that we need to stand uh, very closely with our Egyptian friends uh, as they confront serious uh, challenges to um, their security. Uh, there's no question that uh, when you're looking at uh, Sinai, uh, when you're looking at organizations like Ansar uh, Beit al-Muqaddas, uh, or when you're looking at some of these incidents in the Western Desert, uh, there is no doubt in our mind that uh, Egypt confronts a serious um, challenge to its stability, uh, and that challenge requires uh, that there be a firm uh, response on the part of uh, security forces. And therefore, uh, we, have, uh, we have supported that, uh, we'll continue to support that. Uh, Secretary Kerry's decision on the Apaches the other day was uh, aimed specifically at, at that threat. Uh, at the same time, 
Uh, we also believe that it's important not to, uh, um, uh, to push to the extremes uh, people who are not uh, uh, violently opposed to the regime, the people who can be brought into a political process, people uh, who uh, want uh, the right to speak freely, uh, but uh, who don't uh, present a security challenge to the government. Uh, and so we think it's important in order to build a strong society that we distinguish uh, between those uh, elements who present a violent challenge, uh, whose objective is, is frankly to undermine uh, the, uh, the uh, law and order uh, and uh, uh, the, the basic framework of a civil society uh, and uh, not to confuse them uh, with political opponents or, or people who have a different point of view that they want to express in a peaceful or political way. Oh, thank you. We had a, a terrific panel right before lunch on uh, the economy. And what, sh what really impressed me about that uh, panel was how much energy and dynamism and uh, political will was coming from the Egyptian people, both from the top down, uh, where, where most panelists uh, have agreed today, uh, there have been some significant first steps in real reform uh, just uh, since uh, uh, President Sisi came into office. Uh, it surprised me a little bit that this, this uh, was such a, a view held by so many of the panelists. And then it was so encouraging to see the energy coming from the bottom up, the Egyptians themselves. Uh, not just in the uh, investments in SMEs and the young people with the startups, but also the Egyptian people who have uh, invested 40 billion pounds, uh, it's a statistic that came up, uh, really impressed me, uh, in, uh, the, for the construction of the expansion of the Suez Canal. This is from Egypt. This is development that is coming from Egypt, from Egyptians. Uh, we have always thought in the Foreign Service and my, our talking points for the last 40 years at how important uh, our assistance programs were in Egypt and our aid programs, and it was tied to Camp David. Uh, how important is our assistance program, and is the United States becoming irrelevant when we look at what will really fuel Egypt's future and development? Well, I don't think that, you know, I, I certainly uh, uh, would be loath to suggest that uh, our uh, assistance programs are, are irrelevant. Uh, <laughs> and we certainly wouldn't want to tell American taxpayers yeah. that. Uh, but uh, um, uh, uh, look, I, I think that we look, need to look at this uh, uh, in, the, in the totality of American economic engagement. Uh, and it covers a number of different areas. I mean, certainly... Uh, on the economic assistance side, there are, there are things that we can do that, that contribute. I, we're talking about uh, vocational training. We're talking about other kinds of assistance that will help uh, Egypt build a strong foundation for economic growth and prosperity. Uh, we can uh, certainly engage on issues of economic reform. And I did hear um, a report about your economic panel. And like you, I was um, encouraged uh, by uh, the, the positive assessment that, that several of your panelists had of the steps that are underway that are being taken. It's, it's very good news and, and uh, very welcome news. Um, uh, but then I, I think that we need to, to expand the aperture even a little bit more uh, and talk also about the private sector. Uh, you and I spent uh, our careers as bureaucrats, and so maybe we're not uh, the best people to talk about the importance of the private sector. But um, it is. Uh, it is uh, an essential component. And, uh, and you know, one of the things uh, that we, I believe, can bring to the table in terms of our relationship with Egypt and how we go forward is, one, uh, the American business community, uh, American investment, uh, American markets for Egyptian goods. Uh, all of those things are very important. Uh, but also, I think, you know, the, to encourage... Uh, um, Egyptians and the government of Egypt to look uh, more towards the private sector as the real engine of economic growth and prosperity. And if you look broadly in the Middle East, uh, I, I think that one of the, the things that we've seen is that uh, in, uh, in many of the countries of the Middle East, uh, there has been uh, an undervaluation, frankly, in the role that private sector, <laughs> private enterprise 
uh, private investment play in actually generating economic growth, in creating jobs, in doing all of the things that really become essential uh, for a uh, successful economic strategy. Uh, I think that, that the United States has a lot that we can impart, uh, and I think that um, also we have a lot that we can do to encourage American business uh, to really take a fresh look at Egypt uh, and to uh, find the opportunities uh, to create partnerships with Egyptian uh, counterparts uh, and to really be a part of, of a very promising economic future. Good. You nailed that one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's open it up uh, to the audience. Uh, is there anybody in the first row who would like to ask the first question? If not, let, let's start uh, from the back. Questions? Uh, good afternoon, Hamid Lillou, Operation and Culture Analyst. Uh, I, I quote you, uh, sir, a couple of minutes ago you said, Egypt is a longtime friend and critical partner in the region, and yet we do not have any FTA agreement with Egypt. Uh, second question is, would you propose Egypt to eventually, eventually lead the Arab nation joint military action against ISIL? Thank you. Um, uh, on, on the first uh, question, um, uh, I would say that uh, uh, the FTA aside, uh, the, the... Foreign trade agreement. The foreign trade agreement, mm -hmm. right. Uh, uh, that uh, the nature of our economic interaction with, uh, with the government of Egypt uh, is uh, very strong. We have a number of, uh, of bonds. Uh, if there comes a time uh, where it makes sense uh, to pursue uh, an FTA, then... Uh, I think uh, we can do that. Uh, it's, uh, it's difficult uh, these days negotiating uh, new agreements, but, uh, but it's certainly something that we can consider. Uh, on uh, on the, uh, the second, uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned, uh, 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 Foreign Minister Shukri uh, was in uh, Jeddah yesterday. Uh, the, uh, the purpose of the uh, meeting there was really uh, to help uh, uh, build up uh, the uh, participation in the coalition uh, and uh, to follow the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the strategy that President Obama announced in his speech on Wednesday evening. Uh, there are many different ways uh, that, this, uh, that this coalition, this partnership of, of countries will operate. Uh, the military aspect is only one. Uh, there are a number of other elements that will go into the effort uh, ultimately to, uh, to defeat uh, uh, ISIL, uh, including uh, issues like uh, uh, stopping the flow of foreign fighters, uh, preventing uh, ISIL from, uh, from acquiring financial support, uh, ensuring that people understand, and, and uh, I think that uh, throughout, uh, uh, certainly throughout the Islamic world, in religious communities around the world, uh, it's important for uh, there to be a strong uh, message that uh, people receive that what ISIL rep represents uh, is not in any way, shape, or form Islamic. Uh, it is not something that uh, reflects uh, either the history or the tradition or the future of uh, Islam. Uh, and, uh, and to make sure that uh, those people who might be tempted uh, by uh, the uh, message of uh, ISIL are, are given to understand that uh, this is an aberration. Uh, it is not a faithful execution of anybody's vision uh, of a religious society. So, so all of those different elements. Uh, uh, the government of Egypt, through Foreign Minister Shukri, uh, participated in the issuance of the uh, joint communique uh, at the end of the meeting, it pledged all of the participants uh, to working together on uh, the strategy of defeating terrorism broadly uh, and uh, ISIL specifically uh, going forward. And we'll look uh, forward to working very closely uh, with the government of Egypt on strategies to uh, actually implement that uh, commitment as we go forward. Well, it's a, it's a frightening uh, conflict that we'll be facing collectively, but there's a sub-conflict, a subtext to all of this, and that will be whether the U.S. government will win the battle of calling it ISIL or whether the <laughs> media and think tanks will 
will we'll, uh, achieve the definition of ISIS. Well, uh, uh, and of course, our, our friends and your counterparts in, in the uh, real ISIS, which is the uh, Strategic International Studies, uh, yeah. uh, I think uh, they, they've already voted for ISIL. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I think there's one company that actually changed their name. <laughs> yes. If they want to make a U-turn, it takes them much longer than <laughs> it takes uh, any other smaller uh, creature. And we've seen that very clearly with the revolution of 2011, uh, when it, how it took the United States a long time to uh, stand by the new movement uh, and the changes that were happening in the country. Uh, I feel the same is happening now with this uh, ISIL situation, a situation that uh, Egypt has been facing for the past three years and which has, it has been calling on the United States to realize that this is a common problem that we should all address. Uh, and the United States was always calling or, you know, dealing with it as an Egyptian problem, saying Egypt is facing a problem of terrorism. It's not just Egypt. And it took the United States some time to realize that it is a common problem, only after the unfortunate events that started with the slaying of the uh, American uh, newspaper man. Yeah, uh, and that made President Obama finally come out today and talk about a strategy against uh, this terrorist uh, movement. Uh, why do you think uh, the United States, as we feel in our part of the world, takes such a long time to react to and is not as forthcoming as other uh, powers in Europe or elsewhere, Russia certainly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, why? For obvious reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why? <laughs> No, you needn't comment, comment about that. <laughs> I won't. I won't. Is it, is it because you're an elephant? Is that all? <laughs> uh, uh, look, I, I think that, um, you know, understanding the, uh, the nature of the ISIL threat uh, has been something that, uh, that we've been uh, addressing and coping with for uh, quite a long time now. Uh, um, I think that, uh, you know, uh, 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 the president uh, uh, is uh, somebody who uh, believes uh, that we should uh, understand an issue, that we should uh, think carefully about an issue before uh, we make a decision. Uh, we have been moving, uh, as you know, in that direction for uh, quite a few months. Uh, but I think that uh, the president saw quite rightly that in terms of the situation inside of Iraq, uh, uh, the threat that was posed by ISIL is only one element of a much larger picture, and that is uh, the need uh, really for the Iraqi people um, and the Iraqi leadership themselves uh, to, uh, to come up with new strategies, new ideas. Uh, we had a, a successful election in the spring uh, in Iraq that, uh, uh, that uh, produced uh, a good uh, outcome, a uh, free and fair election in our view. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that the president was uh, very clear in saying that we wanted to see how uh, that was going to be followed up with the formation of a new government because uh, I think that while uh, the United States can play an important role, uh, will play an important role in addressing the ISIL threat, uh, uh, and the rest of the international community can also play important roles. At the end of the day, in terms of Iraq, uh, uh, we won't succeed unless the Iraqi people themselves are firmly uh, with the strategy, firmly with uh, the result. And therefore, he uh, wanted to see that, uh, that the Iraqi people uh, uh, were coming to that same conclusion, were making some of the decisions uh, that would allow them to overcome some of the obstacles that helped permit, it created a permissive environment that allowed ISIL uh, to have the success that it had. Uh, and so we've been extremely pleased uh, over these past few weeks uh, to see the successful uh, uh, selection of a new speaker of the parliament, a new president, 
uh, and uh, just a few days ago, a new prime minister uh, who's uh, put together a, uh, a broad-based inclusive government uh, and has made commitments uh, to, uh, to, his, uh, to his constituency that he will strike out in a new direction of inclusivity, of bringing together the different elements of the Iraqi society. And on that basis, I think President Obama felt more confident in, uh, in, in taking the, the stance that he took because he believed that now in Iraq we have a real partner who's going to work with us and who's going to help us achieve success. Uh, and that was uh, really what drove the timing of uh, the president's decision. Uh, in, uh, uh, elsewhere in, uh, in the region, uh, we have uh, the, same, uh, the same issues. I uh, was in Yemen for three years uh, uh, between 2010 and, and 13. Uh, and I can say that um, in, in the Yemeni context, we had a very similar experience where you know, the, the political transition that was launched in 2011 opened up new opportunities and, and provided us uh, with uh, a much stronger partnership in terms of the fight against al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula there. And so, uh, so when you have that kind of partnership, when you have that kind of engagement uh, with the host government and with the citizens of that country, it makes um, uh, your effort to, to work on these uh, uh, counter-terrorism uh, and, and counter-extremism strategies much more successful. I'm going to try to get somebody from who hasn't asked a question before. Let's see. Thank you. Uh, there have been many press if reports. If you could uh, identify yourself. Yeah, sure. I'm Rafael Danziger, and I'm a consultant to APAC. And there have been many press reports that the United States has established some channels of communications with Iran on ISIL, at the very least in order to de-conflict, as has been uh, said, or perhaps even to coordinate some kind of activities with regard to ISIL. Could you comment on that, please? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think that uh, the, the Secretary and, uh, um, and Under Secretary Sherman have spoken pretty clearly in, uh, to say that there is no coordination between the United States and Iran uh, on, uh, on these issues. Uh, obviously, uh, there are uh, instances where uh, you have uh, governments that have shared uh, or common uh, uh, concerns, common uh, interests. This may be one of those uh, cases, uh, but, uh, but we're not coordinating and we're not consulting with the Iranians on how to go forward on this. In the back there, please. Hi, uh, Zach Gold. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you uh, for could being you identify your Thank you for being with us today. Um, I guess you mentioned in the Jeddah communique that the uh, agreement is, or the pledge is to fight all terrorism. You also alluded that there is a difference in view between the United States and the Egyptian government as to who is a terrorist actor. So I was wondering if you could just reconcile those. Thank you. Well, I, I think, uh, again, uh, um, uh, there is uh, uh, an interest in, in not uh, confining uh, our, uh, our strategies and, and our commitment to fight against violent extremism only to ISIL. It's not the only uh, violent extremist organization that's operating in the region. Uh, uh, in the uh, Syrian Iraq uh, context, you have the Nusra Front. Uh, certainly in Egypt, you have Ansar uh, Beit al Maqdis. Uh, in uh, Yemen and uh, the Arabian Peninsula, we've seen Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, in uh, Libya, we have uh, Ansar al Sharia. Uh, um, and uh, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb. So there are a number of different organizations uh, um, uh, that uh, are of concern to, to all of us uh, that uh, pursue violence as, a, as an instrument of uh, their own uh, efforts to, uh, to uh, win uh, territory or, or to, uh, to dominate uh, political uh, uh, instruments. And, and so... Uh, the United States has been uh, fighting against uh, many of these organizations for many years, uh, uh, some, you know, for 14, 15 uh, years or longer. Uh, and uh, I think it's appropriate to, to look at this broadly as a, uh, as a fight, ag uh, fight against uh, violent extremism uh, with the focus right now on uh, ISIL because 
Uh, we do believe that ISIL is the most uh, serious threat uh, confronting uh, the region and the world at, at this particular moment. Um, uh, over, uh, nevertheless, I, I would say that, uh, that uh, we don't necessarily see uh, all uh, uh, political opposition uh, as uh, extremist or as a terrorist. And, and uh, we think that it's important to, to distinguish uh, very carefully between these, uh, um, uh, between organizations that uh, may have uh, views that we don't uh, like uh, or support, uh, but nevertheless are committed to, uh, uh, to putting their uh, positions on the table and participating in an open, uh, free, and democratic uh, political system, uh, and those who seek to subvert uh, those kinds of systems and uh, undermine them through the use of violence. And so uh, uh, we believe that the success of the effort against violent extremist organizations depends heavily on being able to distinguish between those two different kinds of uh, organizations. Okay, we're going to have time for just uh, one, one, more, one, more. one more. This will probably be the very last one. This fellow in the middle, please. Identify yourself and your organization. Good afternoon. My name is Scott Cooper. I'm with Human Rights First. Um, I liked the way you put it in which you said the U.S. sees no use in the jailing of uh, peaceful protesters and journalists. Uh, I wonder what hope you can give uh, that... For instance, those who are jailed who are not um, members of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, or the like. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, Yara Solomon's been in jail since the middle of June, uh, a delightful young lady that we've worked with before. Um, what uh, progress do you see along those lines? And do you think it's possible that we can make a utilitarian argument that, in fact, it is in their interest to release uh, such people, not extremists, but rather ones that have been jailed unnecessarily? Well, I, I, again, and I think that this is part of the conversation, and Ambassador Taufik is here, and he can uh, speak to it. I, I mean, it is, it is something that we, uh, that we discuss, and, and we believe uh, exactly this, that, uh, that uh, it's, in, it's in the interest uh, of Egypt going forward and uh, on the political side uh, to, uh, uh, to allow people uh, to speak out freely. It allows people, uh, you know, if you keep things bottled up, uh, and don't uh, allow them uh, to, to uh, be expressed in, a, in an open way uh, that uh, eventually it becomes a security problem, it becomes uh, a, uh, an issue of violence. And so it's much better in our view uh, to allow people to speak. Uh, and this is certainly an argument and it's certainly a viewpoint that we express. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking uh, Ambassador Feierstein. Great.